here last night. You didn't hear that message. He, he was going with that message last night, emphasizing about six points. He wasn't even here. He didn't know what I preached. Some of you folks, you must really have a problem. The Lord put it on you twice like that in less than 24 hours. <laughs> All right. Anybody go ahead. Shoot. Yes, sir. Brother Ruckman, is there a prophetic significance in the revival of the unicorn and the rainbow that we see in all the Christian bookstores and that our kids are being plied with? Oh, about the unicorn and the rainbow. First of all, get uh, Psalm 22 in one hand, and then get uh, Genesis chapter Genesis chapter 8 in the other hand, and then with your third hand, pick up Revelation chapter 10. Now, the significance of this, first of all, in the rainbow, is the rainbow is a sign of two things. First of all, it's a sign of peace on earth and God's covenant to bring peace on earth. And because of this, it's a picture of the second coming of Christ to bring peace on earth. Uh, in Genesis chapter, uh, Genesis chapter, Eight, uh, nine. Excuse me. Genesis chapter nine. Genesis chapter nine, verse thirteen. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. We call it a rainbow. In the Bible, just called a bow, and it's called a bow because it's half. She goes like that. It's like a bow that you shoot. It's like a bent bow, like that. Uh, that bow doesn't appear completely to get to heaven. When you get to heaven, John said he saw a rainbow round about the throne. So up in heaven, that rainbow is a circle. You, if you want to see that, you see it best in a plane. If you're flying a plane about 22,000 feet and look down the cloud below, you'll see the shadow of the plane going across the cloud, and there's a rainbow around the plane. And it's a complete circle. And there's a beautiful uh, spiritual application there, and uh, you'll understand it better by and by. You only see half of it down here. You see the rest up there. That's the spiritual application. By right, Revelation chapter 10. Now this thing here takes place right at the end of the tribulation. Revelation 10.1, I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as well as the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. It matches the description of Christ in Revelation 1. And he cried with a loud voice as a lion roars, three, like Christ. And he takes possession of the land and the sea, verse 2 and 3. And that's a preview of the second advent of Christ. So it's a picture of Christ coming back and bringing peace on earth and God settling the thing with man. Now the trouble with it as you see it now showing up is, of course, it's a counterfeit. Everything right now is a counterfeit of something that's going to take place later on. Whether you ever thought it or not, but all the false doctrine taught in this earth is the truth misplaced. Here's a Jehovah Witness, 144,000 say, that's right, but not now in the tribulation. Here's a seven-day Adventist, you're supposed to keep the seventh day holy. That's true, but not now in the millennium. So all this stuff is misplaced. Now that rainbow is misplaced. The rainbow right now as it's showing up is a picture of a one-world religion of humanism that's going on. And it's a, a sign of that one humanistic religion, which is connected with Satan and some things. And I've forgotten the names of all the people connected with it, although I've read several books on it. And that thing is being promoted in uh, all the news media. And that rainbow will pop up more and more. It'll pop up on television. It'll pop up on advertisements. It'll pop up on everything. But of course, when they use it, they're talking about the bringing in of humanism under man as a god, and that'll be the Antichrist. The world never could get it right. Uh, Psalm 22. Now the unicorn is mentioned here in verse 21. And I'm beginning at verse 20, and this is Christ on the cross. Psalm 22 is Christ on the cross. Notice 22.1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? See, it's Christ on the cross. Now with any doubt in your mind about it, look at verse uh, 17. I may tell all my bones. None of the bones are broken. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. It's Christ. And Christ on the cross mentions all these animals. Uh, for example, in verse 12, bulls of Bashan. 
he says. Then he says in verse uh, 20, the power of the dog. Then he says in 21, the lion's mouth. Then he says in 21, save me from the lion's mouth. Thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. Unicorns, plural. Now the classic unicorn is a horse with one horn in the middle of his head. And that's what appears in all the drawings, the medieval manuscripts and scrolls. And the problem comes up, how come we never seen one, and where are they, and this and that. Let's take one more reference, then we'll try to get this stuff together. Uh, numbers. Come back to Numbers. And here's a prophecy on uh, the strength of Israel, given by, uh, given by uh, Balaam. Numbers 24, verse uh, 7. Now this is Balaam prophesying to Balak about the future of Israel. And he says this, 24-7, He shall pour the water out of his buckets, and his seed shall be in many waters, and his king shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. God brought him forth out of Egypt. He hath, as it were, the strength of an unicorn. Or now the unit is one. That's what that is. The unicorn, as an animal, isn't located. There's an animal that can be. It can very well be a rhinoceros. Somebody says he has two horns. You haven't got one big one sticking up there. Talk about the strength of the unicorn, that could be it. But the classic picture is a horse with a horn by the middle of his forehead. Uh, there is such a thing as a real unicorn, but a real unicorn is a goat. There are goats that have been born with one horn out the head. I've got photographs of them. And in Daniel chapter 8, when Daniel has that vision, he dreams of a he-goat with a notable horn between his eyes. So technically there is such a thing as a unicorn, but it's a goat with one horn. Uh, that may be the reference in all these pastures. Turn to Proverbs and I'll show you why. Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs chapter 30. Uh, Proverbs chapter 30, uh, verse uh, 29. Proverbs 30, 29. There be three things which go well, yea, four, calmly and going. A lion, which is strongest among beasts, and turneth not away from any. A greyhound, and he goat also, and a king against whom there is no rising up. Now that he goat there in Proverbs is mentioned in Daniel as a he goat, and Daniel, that big horn between his thing there is the first king, and that first king is Alexander the Great one of the greatest types of Antichrist in the Bible. So there's some way there the unicorn represents a one-horned goat, a one-horned horse, or a rhinoceros, and represents a picture of the Antichrist as far as power goes. Now the last possibility is this. Well, there are two other possibilities. The first possibility is there exists up in heaven unicorns. When old Elisha sees Elijah caught up in the, in the chariots. He says, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And Elijah's caught up in a whirlwind of chariots of fire, horse of fire. Elisha says to the Lord, Open the young man's eyes that he may see. And he opens his eyes and sees the mountains about covered with horses and chariots of fire. When you come back at the second advent with Jesus Christ, Revelation chapter 19, you come back in horses. But they're not physical horses. They're pure energy, the fire, the fire. And those things are called horses. Now who knows whether they got a spike in the head or not? Nobody, nobody's ever seen it. Nobody knows. Maybe they do. One other possibility. <laughs> the other possibility is that once upon a time on the earth, these things lived, and the remnant of those things is in the literature, and that's why they mention them, but they became extinct at the time of the flood or thereafter. Now, a fellow tends to turn up his nose at interpretation, then he ought to go to school and study biology and see some really funny creatures. Um, you study biology and see these animals they think live one time, and you'll, you can see how a unicorn could have been there just as quick as Stegosaurus or Triceratops or Brontosaurus or Pterodactyl, all that Donald Duck stuff. Those are just pictures they got in the book. They said all these things live. Well, let me tell you something. If old Stegosaurus and Brontosaurus and Pterodactyl and all that bunch could have lived, believe me, you sure could have had a horse with one horn on it. So the answer is they probably were there, but they're extinct, and they're a type of the Antichrist, 
and they may be type of real horses, and the real horses up in glory. So the constant repetition, that rainbow theme and that unicorn, is uh, for us, it's a picture that the second coming of Christ is right at the door. For the world, it's getting them ready for the Antichrist. Something else. Yes, sir. In King James Bibles, you have the same King James Bible, but there's various spellings for different names in yes, the King sir. James Bible. What's the answer that you would give for that? Oh, the answer to give that is I wouldn't make an issue of that, because from the time the King James was put out until now, there have been also many variations made and changed. What he's talking about is this. For example, in early editions, as it's Greek, I want English. Uh, soap is spelt that way. Then in later editions, it's spelt this way. Feet in the original King James is like that. Now with the E off it. Uh, you take a thing like this word here, Elias. In the New Testament, there are some editions of King James that will put that down Elijah. Because it is Elijah. You say, why isn't it spelled like Elijah? Because you're coming from Greek and English and instead of from Hebrew and English. If you go into Hebrew and English, you'd transliterate Elijah. If you go into Greek and English, you'd transliterate Elias, just like the habit. Like that thing I was showing you this morning, you see, there is one word in Spanish, and there's the same word in English, and there's the same word in French, and here's the same word in uh, Aramaic, and uh, here's the same word in Greek. Now that thing there is the same, the same word, but you see, here you're going from English into Spanish, and there you're going English into French, so they don't match. That's why that Elias is like that in the New Testament. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't make, I wouldn't be that pickish on the spelling. The King James Bible said Elijah, Elias. I wouldn't, I wouldn't fool with it. And these spellings here. They say, well, the 20,000 changes made between the original 1611 and the edition you have right now, that's true, but they're not telling you what kind of changes they are. They're changes like that. They're changes like this. Here's, a, here's, a, here's a, an original edition of a King James. On, uh, it's Germanic, it's uh, Germanic print. That's Moses. It's Moth Mofeth, <laughs> or sometime here and then Mofeth, <laughs> Mofeth, the five books of Mofeth. <laughs> and the reason not why that thing is, is your English language is kin to German, and the German S comes out there, just that much. And about things an an F, you don't have this, you don't have that thing there. So you talk about 20,000 changes, they're really pulling your leg. There has been a, a natural updating through the years in the King James that was led by God the Holy Spirit to give you what you ought to have, but it's not like these revisions we were talking about this morning. This morning, these revisions we are talking about this morning, that's something different. That isn't just fixing up spellings and punctuation. Those, those new translations, they're, they're attacking Jesus Christ. Yes, sir. You, uh, you drew a line of Bible succession, Bible-believing succession. The uh, Baptist briders try to make that a succession of Baptists. Would you comment on that? All right. I'll take your Bible and turn to Ephesians chapter 5 and 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, Baptist bride teaching is the teaching that the <clears throat> bride of Christ is the local Baptist church. And that anybody who is not in a local Baptist church is not part of Christ's bride or body. And the teaching is that the marriage of the Lamb, that Christ will marry his bride, which will be the Baptist Church. And the saved Methodists, saved Presbyterians, and saved Catholics, they'll be in the family of God, but won't make it the bride. That's the teaching. And that teaching comes from confounding the local church with the body. Now what I wrote you this morning was a, a succession of belief and practice with all those names down there. And it could be Technically, if a guy wanted to be technical about it, he could say, oh, those, those weren't called Baptists. They held and believed what Baptists hold and believe to. Therefore, you could say there's an apostolic succession of the Baptist church from the New Testament right down to those times. 
Well, they may be, but they're not called Baptists, and if they were, they still wouldn't be the one true church for this reason. Oh, I get 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse uh, 13. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. Now, if I was a Baptist brighter, you know what I'd say? I'd run to the Greek, <laughs> and I'd say, in one Spirit are you baptized in one body, and pull out this Greek preposition, in, see? And I'd say, it isn't say, haven't you these holiness now, They've, these Pentecostals quit saying baptized with the Holy Ghost, they're talking about the baptism in the Spirit? In, haven't you heard that? They're running to the Greek to get that, see? This thing here is, I am, that's an epsilon, that's a noon, and they translate that in, and your King James doesn't translate that, your King James translates uh, for by one Spirit. Now the reason why they messed that up is they're not too scholarly. Well, this scholarly stuff is a big joke. And they're in school, they're teaching these kids what we call the nominative and the genitive and the dative and the accusative. Those are case endings for Greek verbs. But that's, uh, that's the amateur way to do it. <laughs> that thing actually runs nominative, genitive, ablative, locative, instrumental, accusative, evocative. There are actually eight cases. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Nominative, uh, I want to get all of them. Uh, nominative, genitive, ab, ab, nominative, nominative, genitive, ablative, locative, instrumental, dative, accusative, vocative. There are eight cases. Now these are eight cases, and this word in here is what you call instrumental, or can be locative. Now what's happening in these schools are teaching Greek, they're teaching them here this 4K system, and they don't know the 8K system. The term in is never translated in unless it's location, locative case. And that thing in 1 Corinthians 12, 13 is not location, it's instrument, by one spirit. Now, you don't need Greek to know that. What I'm telling you is your King James Bible is right, and the Greek scholars are wrong, what I'm telling you. All right, verse 14, for by one spirit are we all baptized in one body. Now, are you saved? Are you saved? Amen. Or if you're saved, the Holy Spirit puts you into Christ's body when you got saved. By one spirit are we all baptized in one body. The Holy Spirit puts you into Jesus Christ. That isn't water. That's spirit. All right, come over here to, to uh, Ephesians. And pick up Ephesians chapter, Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3. Ephesians 4, verse 3. Ephesians 4, 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit, the bond of peace. There is one body, one body, one body, not two, there's one. Here's a local Baptist church. Is there another local Baptist church in town? Well, that couldn't be the body of Christ, there's only one body. Unless this is the one body here and the rest of them are heretics. <laughs> There's one body, all right, one body, one spirit, even as you're called in hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. What's that one baptism? All right, if you're a church of Christ, it's a Campbellite elder baptizing you in the church of Christ. If you're a Catholic, it's a Catholic priest sprinkling you with the fountain. If you're a Baptist brighter, it's a Baptist baptizing you in the local church. Because the local church is the body, and the water puts you into the body. So the thing goes. Now, if it's water, then everybody's all taught. If there's only one baptism, it's water. What are you going to do with 1 Corinthians 12, 13? By one spirit are we all baptized. If water baptism only baptism, what puts you into Christ? Nothing. <laughs> now, that's the problem. Now, if you say, don't you see why people can fool around Acts 2 so much? Because in Acts 2, somebody is baptized with the Spirit, and they get baptized with water. And that's why people love to hang around Acts 2. That's the most confusing part of the Bible. <laughs> All right, there's one baptism. What is it? It's got to be Spirit if you believe 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Then why do you get baptized in water? 1 Peter chapter 3, water baptism is a figure of that true baptism. So if a fellow's a real Orthodox Baptist, he believes... The Holy Spirit puts you into Christ, you become part of Christ's body, and as you become part of Christ's body, you should follow the Lord's example in water baptism as a picture of your salvation. 
Christ didn't get baptized in water to get the Holy Spirit. He comes down there and John says, I got need to be baptized of you. I mean, John knew Christ didn't have to be baptized. Only sinners were getting baptized. And Christ says, suffer it to be so for now. And goes down and goes through the picture, even though he doesn't need it. That's your case. Have you got Christ? You have Christ? That's all you need. You don't need water baptism to be saved. You see, we're the bap we Baptists, the only people don't believe in water baptism. <laughs> Isn't that strange? If you get the Methodist handbook, it says a fellow is saved, Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized. Get the 39 article of the English church, the Anglican church, Acts 2.38, be baptized. Lutheran catechism, be baptized. Heidelberg, Westminster, Presbyterian church, get baptized. Catholic missile, get baptized. Baptists, don't get baptized. <laughs> Isn't that strange? The people who don't believe in water baptism are the Baptists. We're the ones that don't believe in it. We believe water baptism is a picture of salvation. It is not salvation. All right, now, if that's true, you know what it means? It means if you're saved, you're a Methodist, you're in Christ's body. But you might, might not be a member of a local Baptist church. If you're an Episcopalian, you're saved, you're in Christ's body, but you're not a member of a local Baptist church. Then the local Baptist church cannot be the body. Because the body has all kinds of saved people in it. The local Baptist church has in it as members only saved folks who found the Lord in baptism. Now, Baptist Brider says this. He says the local church is the body of Christ. How do you get in the body of Christ? Through baptism. By one spirit we baptize. What kind of baptism? Water baptism. <laughs> so the thought takes water baptism and that puts you in the local church. That's supposed to put it in the body. Now, if that's true, you know what that means? That means we get to heaven and sit down the marriage supper of the Lamb. All us Baptists will be there at the table. And all these Presbyterians and Episcopalians and Methodists will be waiting on us. Can't you see Martin Luther waiting on Harry Truman? <laughs> Can't you just see that? Can't you just see that? Can't you just see John Wesley waiting on Jimmy Carter? <laughs> what a flip, man. What a flip. <laughs> Why, just because you're a Baptist, I didn't put you in the body of Christ. Uh, Luther, he was never baptized scripted, neither was John Wesley. But I, I don't have any illusions about it. Those fellows are sure better Christian, a lot of Baptists I've known. Oh, and uh, Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5. I'll show you why the local church cannot be the body of Christ. Now, I'm a Baptist. Don't get me wrong. I'm a, no matter what the brethren say, they can say what I want. I know what I am. I believe in the autonomy of the local church. That's what Baptists believe. I don't belong to any fellowship. We're not in the Bible Baptist Fellowship. We're not in the World Baptist Fellowship. We're not in the GRB. We're not in the Conservative. We're not in the Northern Baptist, Southern Baptist, Free Will Baptist, Primitive Baptist, Hard Shell Baptist, Landmark Baptist, Two Seed and One Baptist. We're just down there, just us, the Lord, the devil. That's all that's down there. <laughs> I support some missionaries out of the World Baptist Fellowship. I support some missionaries out of the Baptist Bible Fellowship. I support some missionaries from Conservative Baptist. I support missionaries God calls to preach out of my own church. But when it comes to those things, I'd be in the autonomy of the local church. A fellow said to Brother Modlish a couple of years back, he said, aren't you going to come to our missionary conference? And he said, no. And they said, why not? He said, you waste too much time. <laughs> and they said, and they, and, 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 and they said to Modlish, well, you're not a very good Baptist, you know, don't go on all these Baptist things. Modlish said, look here, he said, Ruckman and me are the only Baptists in this bunch. <laughs> because we believe that the local church is a unit by itself. And I've always believed that. Uh, we believe a separation of church and state. I don't believe in Social Security. I never took it when it came out. I went down to the, the uh, IRS one time down then. They said, give me your Social Security number. I said, I haven't got any Social Security number. They said, well, you sure have a Social I said, I don't. I didn't want it when it came out. didn't take it. They said, well, you've got to have a number. I said, I don't want a number. They said, well, you'll sign your number. I said, I won't take it. They said, you'll have to take it. They made me take a number for income tax purposes, when I didn't want the number, didn't ask for the number, didn't want the money, and didn't ask for the money. You know what that is? That's communism. That is, you call that life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness? I care nothing about it. I've never carried life insurance or health insurance or oh, that kind of stuff or Social Security a day in my life or hospital insurance. None. I believe it's just, now you can do what you want to, like the brother said. These folks talk about faith to me, they're going to go in one ear and out the other. 
I've trusted, I've been saved 35 years, God's going to take care of me or I'm going to drop. I've made no plan for the future at all. I've got one plan beyond three o'clock. <laughs> Absolutely none. Well, how I got off on all that? <laughs> well, anyway, <laughs> separation, I'm not even having started yet, buddy. And separation of church and state, that isn't all. I believe in the eternal spirit of the believer. That isn't all. I believe an adult believer should get immersed in water as a picture. I'm a Baptist, no matter what the brethren say. But by the same token, I'm not dumb enough to think that my local church is the body of Christ. Suppose a letter came to, to Seattle and it said, to the church in Seattle, greetings. Who would get the letter? He'd say once, I got this apostolic succession from the Novations and Donatus, it's me. And a GRB say, we're Baptists too, we got here first, it's us. <laughs> and the Catholics say, no, he said, I'll build this church upon Peter, it's us. And the Camelites only one church, Church Christ, it's us. <laughs> no, I didn't admit, the church in Seattle are the same people in Seattle. That's the church in Seattle. All right, Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse uh, 24. Therefore, as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be of their own husbands and everything. So forth and so on. Verse, 20, uh, verse uh, 30. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. I'm a member of Christ's flesh. I'm a member of his body. I'm a member of his bones. I'm part of him. How did I get to be part of him? Not through water. God is a spirit. He that has joined the Lord is one spirit, not one water. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the spirit is spirit, and that which is born of water is quack, 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 quack. <laughs> I mean, I don't, teach, I don't teach that water baptism puts anybody into a local church. Now, I require people out of my church to be baptized in order to become a member. I'm a Baptist. I'm not ashamed of that. When it comes to fellowship, I can have fellowship with any saved child of God if he believes that book. When it comes to membership, I require him to get baptized in the water. But I don't think that water puts him into the church. I think it puts him into the water. <laughs> I mean, you can't get the blood of Christ through the city water system. If they put fluoride in it, you'd be a hard shell Baptist. <laughs> All right, Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 31. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. There is nothing mysterious about a local church. Absolutely nothing. In the Bible, in the Bible, the Sigma Nu, the Kappa Kappa Gammas, and the Masons are, church, are churches. A church is a call-out assembly. Mason, Elks, they're call-out assemblies. They're all churches. There's nothing, there's nothing peculiar about a local church called out. The mystery is a church that's a body. That's the mystery. So along that line, we teach this, or I teach this. I teach that although there have been an unbroken succession of people who could be called Baptists from the time of the New Testament till now, which I believe, or they practice Baptist doctrine, which I believe, I would never make the mistake of thinking they were the sole exclusive members of the body of Christ, bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh, I'm sure in the dark age of a thousand of Catholics who are saved. I'm certain of it. I'm certain a thousand of them are saved now, in spite of the church. I can't have fellowship with them. I, mean, I can't have fellowship with a prostitute. <laughs> Let us own some pimp like the Pope. <laughs> oh, boy, what a thing to say. I mean, <laughs> well, now, let me explain myself. I better explain this on tape. Let's get on tape. Oh, now let me explain myself, some of you tender souls. <laughs> now listen, listen, dearly beloved. <laughs> Revelation 17 says there's a city built on seven mountains, amen? amen? And she calls mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and abomination of the earth. She's a prostitute. Do you know what you call somebody who drums up business for a prostitute? Okay. All right, something else. Yes, sir, go ahead. I just have a brief question, but before I ask it, I wanted to ask this question, and that is, do I understand rightly that you believe that the King James Bible does not have any errors in it whatsoever? Yeah, I believe it's without proven error. That is correct. I'm not going to...
this is just to, so that people understand my question. No, I don't mean you showing off. I asked the question. Uh, okay, so I'm going to... What's the next question? The next question is... Um, okay. In Acts chapter 12, verse 4, it, uh -huh. it mentions Easter. Yes. And according to this book here, just so everybody knows, to Babylon, yeah, but that's Easter not in the is question. the worship of Ishtar, yeah. uh -huh. which is the a Nineveh god anyway. So what's the question? And the question is, is well, I'm getting to it, um, and according to this, vines... Yeah, but what's for, the question? For us who don't know Greek, uh, I'm, I'm getting to it. Oh, um, well, you sure have a long way of getting to a question. Well, well, you know, if Paul asked me for a question, I could shoot him down in two seconds. Give me, a, give me the question. I'm going to give it to you. Give it to me. Okay, here it comes. Anytime you're ready. <laughs> okay. Um, since the Greek word is not, according to Vines, yes. uh, Easter, but yes. Passover. That isn't the Greek, to, that's the English. This, you quoted the English, not the pardon Greek. Pardon me? You quoted the English, not the Greek. But, but the King James is the one without the error, right? Yes, that's right. Okay, so. So what's the question? Okay, so the question is since, since it's translated Easter. But in uh, the Texas Receptus, it's Passover. How do you explain that, if that's right. not a mistake? I have a seat in the first place, and the Texas Receptus is not Passover. The Texas Receptus is a Greek text, and there's no such Greek word as Passover. So what he's actually talking about is a Greek word, and the Greek word looks like this. And this word is not, uh, is not Passover. It's Pascha. And if you put that thing transliterated, you'd have this, like that. And from that thing there, you get the Passover as the Passion Week, like that. And the word is generally translated into English, not the Receptus, which is Greek, but generally translated Passover. Now the problem comes up, why in the King James Bible in Acts chapter 12, verse 4, didn't they translate it as Passover? Instead, they translated it as Easter. And the, and the problem is why. And before you get into that thing there, you ought to get old Martin Luther. Martha, Martin Luther really do it. I mean, Martin Luther give it this. Every time it shows up. Every time the word Passover shows up, Martin says, Easter, Easter. <laughs> Every time. And the reason why that is because Martin Luther is trying to get a German, and Martin Luther figures, well, these Germans always associate the Passover with Easter, so I'll call it Easter which he did. Now the question is why? All right, take your Bible, turn to Acts chapter 12, and we'll see why. Verse 1. Acts 12, 1. Now about that time Herod the king stretched forth his hand to vex certain of the church. Who's Herod? He's a Roman king. Verse 2. And he killed James the brother of John with the sword, and because he saw it pleased the Jews. Now you got two groups there. You got Romans, you got Jews. It pleased the Jews also, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. Now, regardless of how Pascha was going to be translated, you still knew it was the Passover. How would you know it was the Passover? Because he said, then were the days of unleavened bread. The Feast of Unleavened Bread is the Feast of Passover. So he already told you one time what it was. For a Jew. Now you're going to tell what it is for a Roman. Verse 4. And when apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. What were the days of unleavened bread for Herod? They were Easter. Why? Because Romans kept the feast of Easter, and the book he showed you there is a book called The Two Babylons by uh, Hislop, where the Babylonian goddess Ishtar is worshipped, and that's where the term Easter comes from. If you want to see it in the King James, turn to Judges chapter 2, verse 13, and you'll see the other spelling on it. Judges 2, 13. There are three spellings on this uh, Babylonian goddess. Uh, Judges chapter 2, verse 13. And in Judges 2, 13, she's called Ashtoreth. Like that. Now that woman, it's a woman. Eastern Ishtar, named after Ashtoreth, she's a Babylonian goddess, and she has a very peculiar title. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 44, which a Roman picks up immediately. Roman chapter, oh, there's nothing like a King James Bible to straighten out a Greek lexicon. <laughs> All right, Jeremiah chapter 44. 
Jeremiah chapter 44. And here's uh, Jeremiah chapter 44. Here's uh, Jeremiah, and he's uh, talking to the, the Jews. And in Jeremiah chapter 44, 25, he says this, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, Ye and your wives have both spoken to your mouths, and fulfilled with your hand, saying, We will surely perform our vows, we have vowed, to burn incense to what? The Queen of Heaven. Isn't that a peculiar thing? Verse 18, For since we left off to burn incense to the Queen of Heaven. Verse 19, And we burn incense to the Queen of Heaven. So that woman has a title. And she's called the Queen of Heaven in the Bible. She's a Babylonian false goddess, and she's a woman. The Germans call her the Lorelei, and the Scandinavians call her the Arrow Woman. Now, she's, all, she's called Venus in Roman mythology. She's called Diana in Syrian theology, and the Catholics have a term for her. They call her Mary. And that old Jewish maiden that that angel made that announcement to is no more connected with that Babylonian god than Teeny Tim is connected with Larry Zonka. (laughs) They're not the same kind. They're not in the same bracket together. All right, so this Roman here is worshiping a Babylonian goddess named Ishtar, and her feast is the Feast of Unleavened Bread for a Jew. But to him, that thing's Easter. Well, how'd this uh, Roman get hung up with this thing? All right. You know who Herod was? I mean, his family tree. He's an Edomite. You've got to get that from Josephus. He's a, he's a Roman governor, but he's, he's connected with Edom. It's a long way around, but here it goes. Revelation 17. Revelation 17 in one hand, and um, Genesis 14 in the other. The little boy is an Edomite, and there's no doubt about an Edomite religion, especially if he's a Roman governor. He's going to have a Babylonian background. All right, Revelation 17. Now here's Rome, sitting up here in these seven hills, in Roman seven, in Revelation 17. All right, let's look at this thing. Verse, verse uh, 3. He carried me away in the spirit of the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names and blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. What is the woman? Verse 18. Read it. Verse 18, the woman which thou sawest is what? The woman is a city. You see, in the Bible gives you a figure, tells you what the figure is. Somebody said, well, the book of uh, Revelation is apocalyptic and symbolical and figurative, and I can't understand it. You can when he tells you what it is. He said, the woman is a great city. Oh, she's sitting on this seven-headed beast. What are these seven heads? Look at verse 9. And here's the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven what? Mountains. It's a city built on seven mountains. That's what he told you it was. Well, let's see about this city. Four. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet. You've got to find a city built on seven mountains whose colors are purple and scarlet. Oh, I wonder what that could be. <laughs> Decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup. You drive around in Seattle any place, you sign out in front of a church with a gold cup on it and a thing like a PX, RX prescription sitting there in the thing. Out of gold and purple. It's just a pair like this. Is that thing sitting out there? That thing is a golden cup, and those colors are purple and scarlet. Not coming to the city, but on seven hills, seven mountains. What about this city? Chapter 18. Chapter 18, verse 24. And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints, and all that was slain upon the earth. The woman's a killer. What does she kill? She kills Christians. Look at chapter 17, verse 6. I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. That was the Reformation view. The Reformation view was the Roman Catholic Church was a whore, and the Pope was the man of sin. Now, you Americans are so far removed from the Reformation, you've lost your roots. See? And so when you talk about these things, you just get upset and disturbed. Oh, I just don't think I can be. Well, what a thing. Well, I just can't believe that. With those good nuns down at St. Catherine's Hospital, I just love you. And the trouble with that thing is, you cut off with your roots, you don't know your background. 
Now, I believe that. He's supposed to talk about, you know, the Phil Donahue show, you know, is that his name, Phil? I'm thinking of Al Donahue, a saxophone player, that's from some other age. <laughs> you get them, you get them mixed up after a while. But they're talking about this talk show, you know, where they talk about the issues and bravely face the issues. Nah, 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 mm -mm. No, you come here tonight, tomorrow, and you'll hear things said in this room that nobody would dare say on television morning, noon, or night. Because these little, old, these little old buildings you see up and down this country, a little old independent Baptist church, a little buildings, you'd be surprised what's in them. <laughs> Put me in that Donahue show, I'd blow every tube in the circuit in five minutes. Boy, what you talking about? Come on. Facing the issues, boldly discussing the issues of sexology. Ah, oh, your foot, man. I get in there and say, well, what do you think about the Catholic Church as a religious whore? <laughs> blow every tube in the place, man. But that's what they believed. That's what they believed. Now, why? look at this connection here. This Roman city is called Five Mystery Babylon. Babylon is called. Now, go back to Genesis chapter 14. You know who these Babylonians are? They're down south of the Dead Sea in Eden. Many years before Christ ever shows up. Genesis 14, 1, it came to pass the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar. How many of you know where Shinar is? Did you ever read Genesis chapter 11? It came to pass, they journeyed from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and said, Go to, let us build a city and tower whose top may reach to heaven. They had a slime for mortar and, and bricks they had for a stone. The Lord came down and confounded the language and called the name of that place Babel. That's uh, Shinar. That's where this bunch is from. King of e Elisar, Kedorim, or King of Elam, and title King of Nations, that these made war with Barak, King of Sodom, and Bersha, King of Gomorrah, and Shibna, King of Adma, and Shebim, King of Zeboim, which is the King of Bela, which is Zoar, and all these were joined together in the Vale of Zidim, which is the Salt Sea. Now, here's what you've got here in the map. You've got these Babylonians clear down here in South Palestine before Moses shows up. You got a thing where Palestine like this, and there's the Galilee, and there's the Jordan, and there's the uh, Dead Sea, and here's Sodom and Gomorrah down here, and Babylon's over here, and that king of Shinar is clear down in here with these kings fighting. You know what that country is called? It's called Edom. Those Babylonians are down there before the time of Moses. They got their religious stuff with them, and they're pass that stuff on down. When Herod shows up, he's an Edomitian usurper, an Edomite usurper to the throne set up by the Roman governor as king over the Jews at that time, so he observes Easter. That's the answer to the question. The King James is always right, the other's already wrong. What else? What else? Yeah? Just explain to me. I thought that uh, Herod, I thought he was a king or some kind of a, a sub-ruler of the Jews appointed he, because the I, I was under the impression that the Romans did not want to hassle with the Jews, therefore he was in, uh, in a kind of a Jewish position and had some kind of lineage in there. Maybe he is, but uh, those titles sometimes are called kings, sometimes they're called governors, sometimes they're called tetrarchs. Turn to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. Get Luke chapter 2 in one hand and get, uh, get Matthew chapter 1 in the other. The reason why these tetrarchs or governors are given the title of king is because the top king didn't call himself king. He called himself Caesar. And Caesar was not a king. He was an emperor. There's a difference. All right, uh, get uh, Luke chapter 3, verse 1. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee. He's a tetrarch. He's called a king, but his technical title is tetrarch. Something else. Yes, sir. Second Peter chapter 3. <clears throat> In Second Peter 3 it says, But uh, for this they were willingly ignorant of the word of God. The heavens were of old, the earth standing out of the water and in the water. The heavens were of old. Uh, do you believe that that was uh, before the, or between Genesis 1, 1, and 1, 2? And, one, and, if you, and if it is, if the heavens were of old, standing in the water and out of the water, verse 6, whereby the world that then was, uh, being overflowed with water, perished, I believe uh, you. I think I think you believe it's between Genesis one 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 two. 
Then in, in uh, another thing, Second sec, Peter chapter two verse five. Well, what's the question, brother? Well, this the, the, this is the question. Yeah. Second Peter two five, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah the eighth uh, person, and it called it the old world, where the God destroyed it with Noah, and then it's called also the wor- the wor- old world in um, Second Peter three. Uh huh. Can you kind of help me out on that? Reconcile All right. the difference. All right. There are three there are three worlds in Second Peter chapter three. There's the world that then was, the world that now is, and the world is going to be. Now look at these three tenses. Second Peter chapter 3. All right, here's the first one. Second Peter 3, 5. For this they will in ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. All right, then you've got a, a world here like this. And the world that then was being overflowed with water, perished. But this is the one that was. Now here's the one that is. Seven. But the heavens and earth which are now, well, then that second one is the one that's outside the door. Because when Peter writes that, he's not writing that before the flood. He's writing that 2,000 years after the flood. When Peter says the heavens and earth that are now, he's talking about the one at the time of Christ, his own time. So there was one then, and there's two, and the two is the one you're on now. Now there's a third one coming up. Uh, verse 13, Nevertheless, we, according to this promise, look for new heavens and new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. So there are three of them. There are the heavens and earth that was, it's destroyed by water, the heavens and earth that are, and how they're going to be destroyed. Verse 10, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements melt with a fervent heat. All right, then there are th- only three worlds. There's the world that then was, it got drowned out. The world that now is, it's going to be burned up, and the world's yet to come. Now, the reason why you can't confuse that with Noah's flood is for a couple of reasons, and we'll talk about that here in the passage. Uh, chapter 3, verse 5. For this they are willing to know, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, the earth standing out of the water and in the water. That isn't true of Noah's day at all. The earth wasn't standing out of the water and in the water. There were seas and oceans in Noah's day. There had to be, because I mentioned Genesis 1. God made seas and oceans with whales and fish in them. This thing here is something where the earth is standing out of the water and in the water. It's floating like a cork. The Father has fell asleep. All things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Genesis 1.1. It can't be Genesis 6. The beginning of the creation is not Genesis 6. So you've got a thing going here where there was a world here in Genesis 1-1, and that world was overflowed with water in Genesis 1-2. And that's this thing here. Darkness upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the what? Drown. Waters. All right, then you got this thing Noah's on over here. And Noah's on over here, and in his day, it's drowned out, see? That flood comes again. But that water dries up, and that earth that dries up there is the one that you're on now. Then it burns up here in Second Peter chapter 3, and this one over here is in Revelation chapter 21. That's a new one. Now, I'll show you another way you know these things are so. There's a difference. Here, and this, is, this is how the King James gives light on the Hebrew. <laughs> you get in Genesis chapter 1, 2, and it said the earth without form, though it, I've got a syllabus, about 15 pages, from Bob Jones University, where those who hold to the gap theory oppose those that don't hold to the gap theory, and the Hebrew says the earth was, well, Eretz was, uh, Wohu and Tohu and Tobu, a bunch of Hebrew words there. Got batting his brains out for nothing. But if he read his King James, he'd know something. Here's what he'd know. When old Noah steps out of this ark after this here flood, he steps out there and he has three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. You got three sons. And I better put it at the end of the flood. There, Noah steps out there at the end of the flood. He got three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. 
When God makes Adam, he has three sons, Cain, Abel, and Seth. One of Noah's boys under a curse, Ham. One of Adam's boys under a curse, Cain. When Noah gets out, the Lord says, be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. When Adam shows up, Genesis 1, 27, be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. When Noah sins, he's naked. When Adam sins, he's naked. When Noah sins, he puts something in his mouth he shouldn't have put in his mouth. When Adam sinned, he put something in his mouth he shouldn't have put in his mouth. So if there was a flood before Noah, there had to be a flood before Adam. They marched straight through. They marched straight through. If you had a New King James Bible and bought it, it wouldn't say replenish the earth. It'd just say fill the earth. They've removed the key to the interpretation from the English. Why? Because the Hebrew didn't say replenish. And it didn't. This is another case where the English is superior to the Hebrew. <laughs> donkey shame, bit of shame, donkey shame, bit of shame. <laughs> oh, that gets them so upset. It gets them so mad. And there's nothing you can do about it because it's so. It's like God has given advanced revelation. And he is. All right, something else. Do you have one back there in the back of you? Okay, I'm good brother. Yes, sir. I was looking for something to fear after I was saved of the Lord, and it ran me to some passages in Hebrews, and I've been told that those may not uh, comply to us in Hebrews 10.26 and 10.38. Is that our God is consuming fire? No, the, it, uh, 26 reads, For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. Uh -huh. That's real tough. And our time is about up. <laughs> uh, now, you're talking about something to fear. Let's get something straight before we start anything. Let's get something straight. Uh, he that feareth God shall come forth of them all. Uh, Paul on epistles, Philippians. Uh, he says, Serve the Lord with fear and trembling, for it is God that worketh in you. First John says, Perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. So the modern approach is this. The modern approach is if you're afraid of God, then you can't get perfected in love. It's an unhealthy emotion and bad for you. But the pastor I quoted in 1 John has nothing to do with your conduct as a Christian. It has to do with you worrying about going to hell. The pastor in 1 John said, Herein we may have boldness in the day of judgment, for as he is, so are we in this world. The passage in 1 John said you're not to be afraid about going to hell after you trust Christ. And if you doubt your salvation, then you're not made perfect in love. But the passage in the Pauline epistle says, Serve God, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Paul says, I was with you in weakness and fear and trembling. So the, in the book of Proverbs, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. He that feareth God shall come forth from all. There's a real, there's a real pastor. The Lord comes down to Mount Sinai, gets ready to talk with these people, and he scares the fire out of them. And they say, we don't want to hear him anymore if he speaks anymore. We're going to faint. We can't stand the sound of that voice. Uh, quit. And when Moses comes down to the people and speaks them about this, and they're worried about quitting, he says, fear not, for God has come to put his fear in you that you might not sin. He says, don't be afraid. God came to scare you. <laughs> not weird, weird. Now what this means is this. From from our now we'll talk about this verse in a minute, but and get it placed right. But let's get us placed right first. Our place is we have a father. Amen. Amen. Should you love your father? Amen. Should you fear your father? Amen. Yes. And if you don't love and fear your father, he's not a very good father. If you just fear him, he hadn't been kind enough to you. See, if you just just fear him, don't love him, he hasn't been kind enough to you. If you just love him and don't fear him, he's been too soft with you. Now, don't you worry about God being a good parent. God will get just the right balance. <laughs> He'll get it so you have plenty of reason to love him and plenty of reason to scare the tar out of you. And there's nothing in the world more healthy for a child of God than a good fear of the Lord. Amen. Nothing any more healthy than that. So, it's always just a wild generation, man. You know, brother 
uh, nobody's telling you about it, and I'll add some things to it. It's, 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 the, it's the cuckoo generation. It's what got one ding bat for, for a minute, ma'am. I mean, the wimps are just wall to wall. <laughs> You've got a generation where they can't get anything right. This business about fear and gone. Well, I just wouldn't serve a God I couldn't fear. Well, you're just nuts. That's your problem. And you, I've heard folks say, well, you can't scare me into getting saved. I just don't believe in scared. Listen, you go down that highway and just don't let that red light bug you. Just sail on through it. You can't scare me. <laughs> Why, you lose your head, you fool. Some of you folks are afraid of dying. You've got life insurance. You're afraid of collisions. You've got a liability. You mean to sit there and tell me you don't believe in fear? You believe in fear. The thing is, average American just he's afraid about cancer, afraid about not getting married, or afraid about getting married, or something else. And he's always worried about something, except that he's never, he doesn't fear God. That's the problem. I, I can tell you who in this, you think these kids are four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. I can tell you which one of them is going to mount to something in ten years for Lord Tarry's, not even knowing the names, the ones that fear God. The young man or woman that fears God will come out on top every, every time, no matter what else he's got, he'll come out on top. So I want to get that straight. Now we ought to fear God. Now about the passage. The passage certainly does not apply to us, and I'll show you why. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. Hebrews 10, 26. For if we, we'll say it's Christian, sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, how many of you have received knowledge of the truth? Let me see your hands. All right. How many of you have sinned willfully at least once since you received that knowledge? Let me see your hands. The rest of you are lying. You have. <laughs> You're just dishonest, just crooked, just crooked. I say you haven't sinned willfully. Sure you have. Who are you trying to kid your grandmother? All this stuff, these holiness people. Well, I didn't sin. I just made a mistake. Yeah, yeah. You didn't, you liar. You juggle back and forth in your mind what you do and decided to do it. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Glad to help you. Anytime I have, let me know, ma'am. 26. All right, if you sin willfully after you receive the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. Is that true? Well, of course it isn't. Nope. Look at 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. <laughs> you got a sacrifice for your sin to last forever. Look at verse 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. I don't understand. I got you, buddy. I got you, brother. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> All right, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, you see there? For by one offering hath he perfected, forever and sanctified, one sacrifice for sins forever. Well, that couldn't apply to you, 26. Your sacrifice lasts forever. It can't be said of you that remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. It's aimed at somebody. But who's it aimed at? Well, verse 27. But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. That isn't you. You're part of his bone, part of his body, and part of his flesh. That isn't you. Romans 8, 29 says, Whom he did foreknow, he did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. You know where you're going to wind up? You're going to wind up just like Jesus Christ. If you're saved, that's how you're going to wind up. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy of trodden underfoot the Son of God? and count of the blood of the covenant, whereby he was sanctified, an unholy thing, and none despite the Spirit of grace. For we know him that have said, Vengeance belongeth to me, I will recompense, saith the Lord, watch it. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. Who are his people? How many of you say Jew? Let me see your hands. How many say Christian? How many don't know where we're at? All right. All right. Check the cross reference. Have you got a reference Bible? Where is the cross reference? Deuteronomy 32. Go back and look at it. Compare Scripture with Scripture. You find a verse you can't understand? Compare Scripture with Scripture. Deuteronomy 32. All right, Deuteronomy chapter 32. Here's the quotation. And notice the quotation has nothing to do with any Christian in this building. There aren't any Christians around. Christ hadn't died yet. Hadn't been buried, risen from the dead yet. Deuteronomy 32, verse uh, 36. For the Lord shall judge his people. Verse 35. To me belongeth vengeance. It's aimed at the Jews. What was the name of the book you just read? 
Hebrews. The thing that ain't in Hebrews. That is not. We can tell where we are when we look at this thing here, because this thing here is the second advent passage. Look at this thing. Verse uh, 43. Rejoice, O ye nations, they are Gentiles, with his people, with Israel. For he will avenge the second advent, the blood of his servants, and render vengeance, second advent, to his adversary, second advent, and be merciful to his land, second advent, and to his people, second advent. It's a second advent passage. The whole thing is second advent. Now let's go back to Hebrews and we get the thing right. Hebrews chapter 10, this passage is aimed primarily at somebody in the tribulation. And it's a warning to them that even after they've been sanctified by the blood of Christ, I hate to say this, <laughs> they can lose it and go to hell. Now, that's something for a Baptist to say. Boy, you said that, you done, you done blew it, see. I mean, Baptists both believe you can't lose it. Well, I don't believe you can lose it. I don't think you'd lose salvation if you tried. But a man would be a fool to say every verse in the Bible taught that. Now, let's put on thinking caps here for a minute. How do you count for the fact that most Christians have always thought you could lose it? They just all just all stupid. John Wesley, one of the greatest Christians that ever lived. He thought you could lose it. Was he just dumb? Didn't read the Bible? Why, there are scores of verses there that look like you can lose it. That's why a lot of Christians think you can, because the verse is there that indicates you can. But you're told, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that eat not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. If you take those passages, you can lose it, you'll find something peculiar about every one of them. Every one of them has a primary application to somebody in the tribulation, not the body of Christ. I'll give you some good ones. Uh, the kingdom of heaven should be likened to ten virgins which went forth to marry the bridegroom. Is that right? No, I didn't quote it right. I took advantage of the fact that you didn't know what the quotation was. <laughs> Boy, I could sure raise Cain if I wanted to, you know. I could really mess him up good. No, ten virgins went out to meet the bridegroom. Not to marry him, see. That's somebody who's going out the wedding after the bride's gone. And those virgins run out of oil. Type of the Holy Spirit. And they've got to go buy it. Works. They don't get it by grace. But that isn't you. If you're a saved, you're part of Christ's body and his bone and his flesh. You're part of his espoused wife. Not some virgin invited into the marriage. Let's take another one. He came back and said, The unprofitable servant, where is my talent? And he said, I know thou art austere and hard man, therefore I took your talent and hid it in the earth. Here you can have what is thine. And he said, Thou wicked servant, if you knew I was a hard and austere man, why don't you give this money to the usurer, that when I'm my coming I might have usury. Therefore take the talent from him that hath and give it to him that, ha oh, here, here that has, and take that wicked servant and cast him into outer darkness. There should be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. The other guy served the Lord went to hell. Now, you know where I'm getting those pastors from? I'm getting out of Matthew on the tribulation. I'll tell you another one. Matthew 25. It shall come to pass, the Son of Man shall come and sit upon the throne of his glory, then all nations shall be gathered before him. He shall separate him as a shepherd, divide the sheep and the goats, and set the sheep in the right hand, the goats in the left hand. He shall say to the sheep, uh, Come ye, blessed my Father, and here at the kingdom of bear you in the foundation of the world. And they said, How come? He said, Because I was hungry and you fed me, I was naked and you clothed me, I was sick and you visited me, I was prisoned. Works, 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 works. Then they say, those on the left hand depart, be cursed in everlasting fire, prepare the devil and his angels. Why? Because I was sick, you didn't visit me? I Works. Hungry, you didn't feed me? Works. I was in prison, you didn't? Works. The whole thing is works. That has nothing to do with you at all. By grace you say through faith, and not not of yourself, the gift of God, not of works, Amen. lest any man should boast. All right, now I'm going to get two passages and show them to you, and then I'll try to draw this thing out in the chart for you, and we better call it a day about here. Well, let's get Revelation chapter Revelation chapter 12 in one hand, and get Revelation chapter 14 in the other. The Bible teaches salvation by faith and works, but not for this age. Not You've got to get the thing right. You say, well, just so much to it, Brother Ruffman. Well, thank God there isn't a whole lot to it to get saved. Amen? Amen. Any dumb many can get saved. <laughs> you know, it's a disgrace not to be saved. Any fool can get saved. Amen. You don't have to have any sense to be saved. You don't have to know everything the King James Bible, the New International Version, you know, or sprinkling. Or All you have to know is you're going to hell and don't want to go. Amen. Now, we're, this is study here. So this is from later. <laughs> 
Uh, Revelation chapter 12. Now look at here. 1217. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to war with the remnant of her seed, which won. Keep the commandments of God. Works. And the testimony of Jesus Christ. Faith. Faith and works. Chapter 14. Chapter 14. Chapter 14, the same refrain, verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God, works, and the faith of Jesus. Faith. Faith and works. Amen. One more. Revelation twenty-two fourteen. This one here is the horror of all. This is pure works. <laughs> Revelation twenty-two fourteen. No, no faith. Just works. By works you say, through works, and not of yourselves, it is not the gift of God. <laughs> what a plan of salvation, man. Revelation twenty-two fourteen. Blessed are they that do his commandments, works, that they may have a right to the tree of life. How many of you folks have always kept the commandments? Let me see your hands. How many of you busted all ten of them? Let me see your hands. If I didn't raise your hand, you're lying again. If you busted one, you busted all of them. <laughs> the Bible says in James chapter 2, whoever shall offend the one point is guilty of all. you hung before you start. All right, now, isn't it a shame I don't get to eat of the tree of life? Because it said, bless those that do his commandments, that right tree of life. I'm not worried about that. You say, why? Well, what do I need the tree of life for? I have life. Amen. I got life from Jesus Christ. I don't have to pick and fruit off a tree to get life. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. I got eternal life with somebody who died on a tree. Amen. It's a mess with a tree. But somebody got to mess with it. <laughs> All right, I'll try to draw this thing out where you can see it. Let me rip off this top sheet here. That's much in it anyway. And uh, I'll try to draw this thing out for you. You know, uh, Eric Marie Remarque says an all quiet on the Western Front. He talks about different things. And he says, uh, so that after you've been in combat for a while, he said, you learn to distinguish between what's essential and what's not essential. He says, instruments have a fine nose for such distinctions. <laughs> And what he's saying is after a while you get down to the place where you you see me throw stuff around here and kick chalk around. I'm pretty careless, that kind of stuff. And I've always been that way. I've been very destructive. You know, just, uh, I, I don't believe integration is the answer to segregation. I believe disintegration. You know. <laughs> I'm with the Germans, man. I believe in case of rain, the war will be held in the auditorium. <laughs> and you get that way from being raised in the military. My people are all military people. Father was a colonel, grandfather was a general, great grandfather was a general, brother was a sergeant, I was a lieutenant. When you've seen grown men, 25 years old, blown to pieces, who had PhDs and their education cost $20,000, you don't ever forget it. Life is worth six cents. That's what a 30 or six shell cost in World War II, six cents. Most smart. Other day, McDonald's, some fool went in there and killed 20 people and moved to 17 of them. Those shells about 15 cents apiece. I don't know who those 20 people were, but there might have been grown people who spent $20,000 growing up. $50,000. I can't believe it. It's cheap. It's cheap. And I know in, in a Christian should have a higher value in life than that, but it's hard to get four generations of military blood out of you. I've seen helicopter sets set up on a, a table, and the guy go down with a ball fiend hammer and just break them into a brand new helicopter. 300 bucks in 1945, man. Forty-five, three hundred bucks, two thousand now. I've seen them take those two and a half ton trucks and line them things up, put a brick on the on the hammer, and take all the oil out of the crankcase and just run them with a block, burn them, stuck, getting rid of excess material, just throw stuff away. It's waste, it's waste, it's waste. Just if it isn't essential, get rid of it. <laughs> and a lot of that kind of sticks with me, so that's why I didn't gently cut that off and roll it up, you know. You can go over here, you know, <laughs> take it out of the way. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's how I treat these brethren that mess with the King James Bible. <laughs> kind, of, kind of the same way. You know, I've got to tell you this. <laughs> Butter said he went to a fight and a hockey game broke out. <laughs> but the reason why, the reason why, <laughs> the reason, 
the reason, you know, you know why I like hockey? Because <laughs> it's about as near to a bayonet fight as you can get in without getting in it, you know. And, and those fights are real. They're real. They aren't stage, man. You, you just, you, you play that game, you come with, nobody's faking nothing, man. I mean, but when you go, when you take that puck and start sailing down there, there's no way to stop the guy unless you just, you know, knock him on the wall. There's no way, you can't stop him. You skate backwards ahead of him, you can't sp- skate backwards all day. If you come at him, he'll go around you. He's out skating, he got momentum, but you can stop him, he'll stop him, man. Can you mind taking that puck down there six times and almost making it and every time have the same guy BAM slam you to that wall? And I mean elbows, they get the elbows in, all they the way umpire can seal that stuff and the back end of the stick going up. By the time you that's happened to you six times and you go down there again, you are so mad boy, you don't care whether you make any go or not. <laughs> I'm gonna get that so and so and you get it, my man. That's how those things go. That's why those hockey players you know, <laughs> Don't have any teeth up there. <laughs> and you take when it comes to that kind of stuff. I, I kind of tend to take that approach to the brethren. <laughs> because I love that book. I love that book. That book saved me and got me my clothes on my back and you people to preach to and paid my plane fare and filled my belly with food. I'm prejudiced. I'm partial toward that book. I've been out in, I've been out in uh, places in Memphis and Pittsburgh and... Cincinnati and St. Louis and Los Angeles and Las Vegas at 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning by myself in motel rooms with the call girls running up and down and phoning in the whiskey bottle left outside and things not right in the home while I was gone. And let me tell you something, I'm, I'm preserved today after 35 years that because of that book. If I hadn't been for that book, I'd have been a dead duck 25 times. So they mess with that book. I mess with them. They kick that book, I kick them. I'm a little fella, I got a big foot. <laughs> All right, now, this, I'm going to try to put this out for you to get this thing straight in Hebrews 10. I get more criticism than what I'm going to show you right now, anything I do. So here's your golden opportunity. <laughs> now, here, Genesis 1 and 2. How is a man saved? Adam and Eve. They're saved by works. There's no faith, because faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things what? Not seen. Why Adam and Eve walk with God? They couldn't walk by faith. They walk by sight. Why he said, you want to die? No, then don't eat of that tree. Works. No faith to it. They fell. Genesis 3, how they saved. By grace through faith. The Lord killed that sheep, clothed that sheep, and the blood was shed for Adam and Eve. They're saved by grace through faith in the shed blood of the Lamb. Abel shows up, offers an oryx and sacrifice. What is it? It's the shed blood of the Lamb. Why don't you go along there from Genesis 3 up here to about Exodus chapter 19. How is a man saved? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Faith. Hebrews. By faith, Abraham did this. By faith, Isaac did this. By faith, Jacob did this. By faith, Joseph did this. Boy, when you get to Exodus chapter 19, something goes wrong. The Lord comes down and says, You want to be a peculiar people to me? You've got to keep my commandments, do my statutes, my judgments. And that bunch said, All the Lord God had said we will do. And the Lord said, Oh, that they were a heart in them to keep my commandments. The Jews put themselves under a covenant of faith and works in Exodus 19. How do you know? John says, The law came by Moses but grace and truth by Jesus Christ. How do you know they're different? Because in Romans chapter 10, Paul says, my brethren, he says, uh, I've got a burden for my brethren. They've got a zeal of God, but not according to righteousness. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves to the Christ, for Christ, the Lord of righteousness, they believe. For the law saith that the man that do these things shall live by them, but the righteous which by faith speaketh this wise, say not, they're not the same. In the Old Testament, it was an element of faith and works under the law. How do you know that? Here's David. Commits adultery and murder. You know what he's doing? He's down on his face saying, Lord, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Could he have lost the Holy Spirit? How many say yes? How many say yes? Well, sure. You say, how do you know? The guy before him lost it. <laughs> the Holy Spirit left Saul and didn't come back. Now, here's a fellow over here, Samson. You know what happened to him? The Holy Spirit left him and came back. 
Aren't you glad you're not saved under that dispensation? You wouldn't know when you were saved. I mean, one guy, the Holy Spirit leads him to come back. Other guy, Holy Spirit leaves him doesn't come back. Other guy, Holy Spirit could have left him and didn't. There's no fixed root in here. For somebody said, didn't have to have the blood at the altar? Yes, but just counting on the blood wouldn't save him. You know what David said when he got that pickle? That fellow came in and said, Thou art the man. He said, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, and multitude thy tender mercy, and came on down to there. And he got the end of that Psalm 51. He said, Burnt offering and sacrifices thou wouldst not. You know what David knew? David knew there was no blood shed down that altar that would cleanse him from his sin. Because under the law, an adulterer or murderer had to be put to death. There wasn't any cleansing. All right, now that thing is in the thing where you sweat the thing out each year. The nearest thing to that is a Roman Catholic. You go to church on Sunday, get through the Mass, confessional, <laughs> safe for another week. <laughs> then go back the next week, safe for another week. I've sweat that thing out. I've sat there, you know, just... Is this the body or isn't it? Well, it looks like bread, but it isn't. But he said it was 20 minutes to digest it, all that kind of stuff. But thank God I'm, I'm saved, and I know I'm saved, and I'm going home to glory, man. I'm not under faith in words. I'm saved by grace. Now you get over here. What happens over here? By grace you're saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works. Not of works, lest any man should boast. By the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse, the law being made a curse for us, for it is written, Curse everyone hangs on a tree. God hath made him to be sin for us who know no sin, be it known to you men and brethren, through this man has preached you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. It's clear, it's not the same plan. But you taking this thing right here, that's got problems. Boy, has that got problems. You know what Jesus says to Simon Peter right before he goes to the cross? He said, I'm praying for you after you're converted to strengthen your brethren. <laughs> Wasn't he converted before? Give us something about this. There is no New Testament to Matthew 27. Because Hebrews chapter 9 says the testament is not enforced till the testator is dead. So technically, the first 27 chapters of Matthew are Old Testament. Matthew chapter 27, Jesus says, 26, this is the New Testament, my blood. But it is an effect to there. So these, you say, what happened to Peter if, he'd, if he hadn't repented? You know, after he cussed and denied the Lord? I guess he'd gone to hell. <laughs> he was only saved in an Old Testament sense. But he gets through <laughs> and comes out over here. When he comes out over here in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit comes down and puts him in the body of Jesus Christ. Now he's safe. But who in Acts chapter 2 knew anybody was put in the body of Christ? Nobody. How do you know? Because not till Acts 9 is Paul saved, and Paul said that mystery of that body was revealed to him. You know, that means, I mean, nobody in Acts 2 knows what's going on. They're just going along there. That Bible sure got a lot in it, don't it? Isn't it funny? You sell the Bible sitting down there and pick it up, and Elihu beget a Benadab, and he beget a Menahab, and he beget a head, and you say, well, what a stupid book. You know, there's <laughs> genealogies down here, all this dull stuff. Pick up the New Testament, love everybody, you know. The goody, good little goody two-shoes book, tell me how to live a good life. That book has got, that book has got stuff in it nobody's got out yet. Now let me show you this thing here. I know they're saved by grace through faith, but in Acts 2, they had to get baptized, get the Holy Spirit. Acts 2, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Do you have to be baptized to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost? No, no. no you don't. Galatians 3.14 says the promise of the Spirit to the Gentiles is by faith. Then something happened between there and there that you, nobody knew about. Let's, I'll, make it, I'll make it real plain for you. That stuff's too difficult. Let's try something real plain. They, Jesus, Peter says, I go fishing. Good thing to do, you know. Earth is three quarters water. <laughs> I go fishing. All right, he gets Matthew, Mark, and Buck and they got in this boat to get fishing. In the morning, Jesus says, You got any meat? Nope, it's coming for shore and I'll give you some breakfast. They pull him out of the ship. They walk up on the shore, and there's the coals there, and on the coals is clam, lobster, scallops, catfish, and oh scamp, scallop, catfish, and lobster. And crab. Could they eat it? How many say they could? Let me see your hand. 
How many say they couldn't? You see, I don't know what I'm talking about. You see, that? <laughs> Leviticus 11 says no Jew can eat anything out of that water unless it has fin and scales. And the scamp don't have any scales. And the crab and the lobster and the shrimp don't have any fins or fins and scales. So according to the law, they couldn't eat it. Why, if they come and there, and Jesus says, here you are, boys, barbecue pork. <laughs> you know what they'd have said? It's the Antichrist. <laughs> don't, you, don't you remember Christ said, I've got many things to tell you and you're not able to bear them? Tell me something. When Peter gets straight on diet, Acts 10, years and years after they had breakfast with Christ, and even then he argued with the Lord about it. Not so, Lord. I mean, see that thing? That is progressive going through there. You don't get it all at one time. Why now? You say, could they have eaten that stuff? Sure they could have. Why? Colossians chapter 3, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances contrary to us, took him out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Wherefore, let no man judge you in respect of meat or drink or see, it's all there. But who knew it? Nobody knew it. Peter didn't know it in Acts 10. All right, then one of these days, out goes the rapture, out goes the body of Christ. What happens? Tribulation starts. Up shows 666, three years at Rome as the man of sin, three years at Jerusalem as the son of perdition. When he shows up there, what happens? You're back under a covenant of faith and works. And I read you the passage in Revelation. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. Keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. Amen. Lord comes back here and finds an unprofitable servant. He goes into hell. Lord comes back here and sits down upon the throne of David and gathers the nation before him and separates them as the shepherd of the sheep and the goats and says to the sheep, Come, you blessed of my Father, and inherit the kingdom. Prepare you the foundation of the world and the goats. Depart from the curse of everlasting fire. Prepare the devil and his angels. Works, 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 works. Then he sets up a millennial reign. You know what happened that you know what happened that reign if you go around and tell somebody by grace you're saved through faith, not not of yourself, the gift of God, you're to be killed. Zechariah said if a guy a guy starts prophesying in the millennium, his mother and father to get him or to thrust him through. Why? Because in the millennium you're saved by sight through works. <laughs> you can't live by faith. Christ is in the throne, you see him. You can't live by faith. There are 20 million replicas of Christ all over the world, the sons of God. It's a different shot. You want to know how to get saved in that period? Read Matthew chapter 4, 5, 6, and 7. That's the Son on the Mount is telling you how to live right then. You say, how do you know that? Figure the thing out. Whoever shall call his brother Rekha. Any of you ever tempted to call your brother Rekha? <laughs> well, you don't know what it means, do you? I have people come around me all the time and say, Brother Ruffman, you couldn't be saved. I say, why not? I say, you call people fools, and the Bible says, whoever will call his brother, thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Well, if that's true, Paul was in a mess, wasn't he? Paul says, but one will say, with what kind of body do they come up? Thou fool, that which thou sowest and not quickly except to die. Sure puts Christ in rough shape, doesn't it? O fools and slow of heart to leave all the prop. Listen, you've got to rightly divide that book. See, certain things go in certain places. And I'm like Brother Noe. I'm a dispensationalist, but I'm a moderate dispensationalist, see? And I know where the divisions are. But you don't find me confining all my preaching in the New Testament. Some of the best sermons I have are the book of Proverbs. I mean, any part of that book is good to apply spiritually. But we're talking here about doctrine. All right, now about that tree of life. This thing takes place. Here comes the white throne judgment. I saw... A great white throne, him that sat upon it, from whose face the heaven and earth fled away, and there was no place found for them. And I saw the dead, a small and great, stand before God. The books were open, another book was open, the book of life. The dead were judged out of those things written in the books. Whoever was not found written, the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. The elements mount with a fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heaven and a new earth, wherein dwelt righteousness. And I saw uh, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, come down, God of heaven, all that kind of thing. Or if you get over there and get this new heaven and new earth, what's over here in this new heaven and new earth? There's a tree of life. What's it for? It's for people who keep his commandments. What do you get from the tree of life? I can figure that out. When God drove Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden, he said, And now lest the man put forth his hand and eat of the tree of life and live forever. Right. Somebody gets eternal life off that tree. Right. Nobody here. You can't get saved by keeping the commandments. You don't get your life off a tree. You get your life from Jesus Christ. 
What's this thing for? Well, this is wild. This is a fellow here, and he keeps the commandments. He doesn't take the beast, the mark of the beast, so he gets his head cut off. He dies. He's down to Abraham's bosom. He's resurrected right there. He lives to be a ripe old age of 650, and he dies right there. And he comes up with the white throne judgment, his name is the book of life. And he goes around and he turns it in. The bird die again, <laughs> except he gets to go in, take that tree, because he kept the commandments. And he lives forever. That is, no, his seed is fixed, because when he takes the tree of life, the Adamic nature is cured. And his children and children automatically have eternal life. You see how? The way Adam and Eve would have had it if they'd obeyed. Listen, God got that thing worked out, man, but whether there ain't a flaw in it, there's not a flaw in it. He said, what about those people that died twice? Well, Jairus' daughter dies twice. Widow of Nain's son dies twice. Dorcas dies twice. Shulamite's son dies twice. Jonah dies twice. Lazarus dies twice. Those are types of people who die there and die there and then go on out. Now, I'm answer your question, brother. <laughs> Hebrews 10 and Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 4 have primarily a doctrinal application of this time. Now, you can use, obviously, you can use them to preach with. In the early part of Hebrews chapter 10, he wasn't talking about this time. He's talking about this time. But he switched on you. You say, when do I know when to switch? Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that he is not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. All right, brother, that'll be enough for a while. Chew on. <laughs> Keep you awake.